This corner of BC is called Lake Country, and for good reason, the perfect place for a quiet paddle. It's where Bert and Arlene Westervelt set out on the afternoon of June 26, 2016. It was calm, clear, and warm. But the trip ended in tragedy. The following day, police pulled Arlene's lifeless body from the lake. To Arlene's mother, Jean Hennig, and her sisters, Wendy and Debbie, the loss is just as painful now, five years later. The biggest heartbreak anybody will ever have is to lose a child. You can't sleep, you can't eat. You're just missing a part of yourself. When one of us had birthdays, and her sisters or myself, and we'd celebrate that. It was just such a joy to our family. The 56-year-old nurse traveled the world in search of adventure. She had an infectious laugh, loved hiking, and being on the water. It was always the, looking forward to the next, the next adventure around the corner, and um, I just miss her so much. On the surface, Arlene's death appeared to be an accidental drowning. At least, that's what local RCMP thought at first. It's a tragic accident that possibly could have been avoided, um, you know, and we feel for the victim and the families and, and everybody involved. But what really happened on the lake that day is still bitterly disputed. When Arlene's husband Bert phoned with the news of her death, her sisters were immediately suspicious. As soon as I heard that, I just screamed. I literally screamed. I said, Mom, this is not an accident. I said, he's done something to her. I didn't even have to ask. I knew instantly that, that he killed her. I just screamed it out. He killed her. He killed her. I know he killed her. I knew it. Why do you think they would say that? I don't know. I, you'd have to ask them. I think it's a hatred, you know, they... You yeah, think it's a hatred? They, they hate me. So it's as simple as that, really. While the Hennig family has screamed murder for nearly five years, Bert Westervelt has said nothing publicly until now. From outside the home he and Arlene once shared, Bert broke his silence to tell his side of the story. Arlene and I had ups and downs, but when it came down to it, there's nobody I'd rather travel with than Arlene. There's nobody I'd rather golf with than Arlene. There's nobody I'd rather hike with than Arlene. There's nobody I'd rather bike with than Arlene. And this is Mr. and Mrs. Bert Westervelt. Bert and Arlene were together for 34 years. But behind idyllic scenes like this one, the Hennig family says their marriage seemed to be on the rocks. My last visit with her, which was about two or three weeks before she died, I sensed there was tension. She and Bert would talk in private and she'd come back with tears in her eyes. Jean would not have known that would be the last time she'd see her daughter alive. There was just something strange about that last hug. And she was crying and I was crying and her body was trembling and I said, honey, it's gonna be all right. So then the next time there was contact was from Bert to say she had drowned. The family believes Arlene wanted a divorce, but Bert says he never had any inkling things were that bad. Were you aware that she was that upset? No, 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 I wasn't. In the days after Arlene's death, the Hennig family says they made repeated calls to RCMP and the coroner. They wanted a more thorough investigation and an autopsy to be sure of how she died. The first conversation I had with the coroner, I begged him and pleaded with him to do an autopsy, and he said there wasn't going to be an autopsy. Despite the family's concerns, Arlene's body was embalmed, and her funeral was held eight days after that ill-fated canoe trip. The story could have ended there, if not for a phone call from a divorce lawyer. That's the moment that changed everything. That is when her divorce lawyer contacted RCMP and told him that she was his client. We don't know what the lawyer revealed to police because attorney-client privilege continues even after death. 
But we do know that call turned the case upside down. RCMP quickly took back custody of the body and started a murder investigation. And even people who had not suspected Bird at first began to change their minds. This is the location where they found Arlene's body. Don Hennig is Arlene's uncle. He was on the lake shore with Bert the day police found her body. She was just like a daughter to me. Uh, uh, she was, I was very close to her. Unlike other members of Arlene's family, Don didn't immediately suspect Bert of killing his wife. They were on friendly terms. But as news of the RCMP investigation began to leak out, his opinion changed. And then when I found out the RCMP were involved, it, I suspected something wasn't right. Don keeps a daily diary, and one entry in particular sticks out. Arlene stopped by for a few minutes last night, was crying. I asked her what was wrong, and she didn't want to talk about it. And uh, Finally, she said to me, uh, I guess all married couples fight. And that was the last time I saw her. Don says there are things about Arlene's death that don't make sense, like the fact she wasn't wearing a life jacket at the time of the alleged accident. She always wore a life jacket, and, and she she was a, a pretty good swimmer, yeah, no problem, and she was in really good physical shape. Why wasn't she wearing a life jacket yeah, that day? Yeah, I can't. Uh, we're getting to that point now where I can't. My lawyer has said I can't talk about it. Bert's lawyer would not let him comment on any of the specific events in the canoe that led to Arlene's death because the case is still technically before the court. But Don talked about it, including the first story he heard from Bert. He told me that uh, he thinks Arlene reached for a bottle of water and uh, just, he said, I leaned over to counteract the way the uh, canoe was leaning and over it flipped. The family says Bert initially claimed the canoe tipped and Arlene surfaced. Then he dove to get the life jackets, but when he came back up, she was nowhere to be seen. Did Bert's story about what happened with Arlene's death change over time? Yes, it did. Don says Bert later claimed that when he and Arlene surfaced after the canoe capsized, there was some kind of struggle in the water. He said she went under and I guess he he grabbed her arm or something and she punched him. I find that very odd. Why do you think his story changed? Well, because I think he was lying. Your story shouldn't change if you tell the truth. What do you think happened to Arlene? I think she was murdered. Do you think Bert murdered her? Yeah, I do. Eventually, the police and Crown prosecutors also believed Bert had killed Arlene. In 2019, they charged him with second-degree murder. But in a stunning reversal, the Crown announced it was staying the charge last summer, offering no explanation why. That effectively brought the case to a halt just two months before the preliminary inquiry was supposed to start. We haven't seen any justice. We need answers. Outraged and demanding answers yet again, Arlene's family held a rally at the Kelowna Courthouse and hired lawyer Anthony Oliver to press their case. So in this case, we had a preliminary inquiry that was scheduled for multiple weeks with dozens of witnesses. And for whatever reason, the Crown's office blew the whole thing up. On June 27, 2016, Arlene Westervelt's body was pulled from the waters of Okanagan Lake. Almost immediately, the investigation into her death started to go wrong. And Anthony Oliver, the lawyer representing Arlene's family, says it all started with a high-ranking member of the RCMP named Brian Gately. Now, what occurred uh, in those early days is still unclear. And it certainly does have something to do with Brian Gately, who was then an inspector with the RCMP. In the days after Arlene's death, but before a murder investigation was launched, Bert Westervelt asked Gately to use RCMP resources to unlock his wife's cell phone. There were pictures there of our, our, our last 
uh, uh, dinner at the point, and I really wanted those. Now, this wasn't a formal request. Burke claims the two men were casual acquaintances. Gately took Arlene's phone and got another officer to unlock it, even though as a veteran Mountie, he should have known that could be a serious breach of RCMP conduct. That was a huge risk to his career to unlock that phone. Why do you think he would do that for a casual friend? I don't know. I don't know. And, and you know, had I known that, I may not have asked him either. Arlene's family believes the two men were actually friends, not mere acquaintances. Her sister Debbie claims Burt wanted the phone unlocked not for the pictures, but to see and potentially wipe clean any secrets it might hold. He wanted to get into the phone and maybe read past texts and conversations and see who she'd been communicating with. Either way, Gately's actions were controversial. Global News obtained this internal RCMP code of conduct letter. It alleges he used a phone hacking tool called Celebrite for personal or unauthorized reasons. Gately refused our request for an interview, but Global News did obtain a letter he sent to Arlene's sister Debbie in February. In it, he claims he only had the phone unlocked after investigators assured him Arlene's death was being treated as an accident. But there's a problem with that too, because there's another allegation in that code of conduct letter that Gately weighed into Arlene's death investigation with his personal opinion, a potential conflict of interest. If he knew a party in the matter, uh, that being Bert Westerfeld, he should have checked himself out immediately, and he didn't. Even though Gately was not assigned to Arlene's case, Oliver believes he convinced investigators to treat it as an accident in those crucial early days. Gately claims he wasn't involved in the case and that his actions did not in any way compromise the investigation or the prosecution. But those code of conduct allegations were never resolved because Gately retired. Arlene's family has since filed a complaint against the RCMP for allowing Gately to resign before the code of conduct investigation was finished. Mike Cavilla is a retired homicide detective in Calgary. The family's lawyer asked him to provide an independent assessment of the case. Was this accidental? Uh, was this non-accidental and inflicted? Is this a homicide? None of those decisions can be made within the first hours of the events unfolding. Cavilla was surprised at how quickly investigators jumped to the conclusion that Arlene's death was not suspicious, particularly given that there were no independent witnesses nearby. Any water death uh, needs to be treated uh, as suspicious and should go to a full autopsy immediately. But that didn't happen. It wasn't until Arlene's divorce lawyer stepped forward that Mounties opened a murder investigation. An autopsy was carried out 10 days after her death, and by then, the body had already been embalmed. It was a mistake that could have resulted in vital evidence being lost. The coroner's report was finally released four and a half years after Arlene's death, and it raised a chilling possibility. The autopsy found hemorrhages on the strap muscles of Arlene's neck and both eyes. Hemorrhages in the eyes can occur, and hemorrhages in the neck can occur from strangulation. Dr. John Butt is a retired forensic pathologist. Although the coroner's report found no marks on Arlene's neck or damage to the bone under the chin, he believes strangulation is still a possibility. He's urging authorities to take another look at the evidence. I think that an independent review in this case would be important. I definitely do. The report also claims the embalming didn't interfere with the forensic examination of Arlene's neck. Dr. Butt disagrees. He says incisions made in the neck during the embalming process could be a big problem for Crown prosecutors at trial. The incision can, of course, mask other evidence that might have been present or create evidence that may be misleading. And it's my opinion that was one of the reasons why the charge against the accused was stayed. While the embalming may cast doubt on the cause of the neck hemorrhages, the doctor hasn't heard an explanation for the eye hemorrhages. 
Well, the hemorrhages in the eyes are not common with drowning, that's for certain. Bert Westervelt says Betty Noble, the coroner on scene when Arlene's body was found, told him she saw no evidence of any injuries. So I asked her for signs of physical trauma and Betty Noble said no. It was emphatically no, none. The report confirms no injuries were found at first. It wasn't until the autopsy was done later that the hemorrhages to Arlene's neck and eyes were discovered. The family's telling us that they were trying to get an autopsy done in the days following Arlene's death, but that you wouldn't allow it. Why were you opposed to it? I wasn't crazy about it because I just felt Arlene had been through enough, you know, and I just wanted I, I really just wanted to leave her be. In hindsight, do you wish that you'd requested an autopsy at the time? I... Yeah, again, yeah. I probably, yeah. Ultimately, the coroner couldn't rule out the possibility that Arlene died from an underlying heart condition, drowning, or strangulation. Her cause of death was found to be undetermined. Bert Westervelt maintains that there was never a solid case against him. You saw the case that was built against you. What stood out to you in that? Why would they charge you? That's a good question. That's a good question. I don't, I don't know. I still to this day don't know how it got this far. So your story changed in the days that followed Arlene's death. Do you understand why that might raise suspicion? Yes, I do, and you know, I, uh, apparently that's a large part as to the reason why I was arrested. Did you kill your wife? Sorry? Did you kill your wife? No, God, no. Arlene died in 2016, and you were arrested three years later. What's this time been like for you? It's been hell, yeah. Yeah, you know, but, but it's not just on me. It's uh, my friends, my friends' family, my family. It's been hell for a lot of people. That might be the only point where Bert and his in-laws agree. We are left with very, very large hole in our hearts. Our family is so broken. We miss her so much. And we want to know why she died. Allegations of interference from Mountie Brian Gately and questions about the competence of the RCMP and BC Coroner Service may have compromised the Crown's ability to prosecute Burt Westervelt for murdering his wife. There could still be justice. The government has the option to order a peer review of the evidence by an independent forensic pathologist. But the clock is ticking. The Crown has until July 14th to restart the murder case against Burt Westervelt. After five long years, Arlene's family just wants their day in court. My sister was a beautiful person whose life mattered and she deserves justice. And make no mistake, we are not going away and we are not going to give up our fight.